in preparation for uh, this message today, I was thinking through um, where people go to get feelings of security, to get feelings, uh, to be reassured that everything's going to be okay. What, what gives us, what, what in life gives us those, a sense of security? What makes us feel more secure? What in life helps us? It's, it doesn't seem like, like sometimes life is just kind of out of control and, and chaotic and oftentimes we suffer at the whims of life and, and if we just gain a sense of control, if we could just gain a sense of security, if we can just gain a sense that everything's going to be okay. And so I started thinking, where do we find that? And, and so I went to some of the best minds out there. I went to Wikipedia. Uh, and, uh, and I came across this one person who was writing about this very thing. And this person said this, some adults in my life, parents and grandparents, are very insecure, although they have the necessities and what many others lack. It seems as though achieving goals, family, house, retirement, and being actually secure doesn't mean one feels secure. Have you ever been there? And the question is asked, how does one feel emotionally secure? Maybe security, they state, is an elusive thing. Because everything can be taken away or lost. One can easily feel insecure regardless of what they have. Because they can lose appearances, a loved one, money, children. Getting older, mortality itself makes one feel insecure. And those are all true things, aren't they? That's where we live. So where do we gain this sense of security? Where do we place our trust that everything's going to be okay? I went to psychology today and I looked up what some of the greatest psychologists have to say about it. And I, they came up with a list of 10 things. They said, if you want to gain a sense of security in life, the thing that feeling that everything's going to be okay, this is their 10 things. I said, one, reach out to others for emotional support. All right. Two, Look for professional advice from people you trust, okay? It's like asking a barber if you need a haircut, asking a therapist if you need therapy. It's just, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. It's, it's good. If you're comfortable with support groups, there's a lot of them out there, they say. <laughs> Fourth thing, get a physical or an emotional evaluation. Uh, to me, that makes me feel more insecure when I'm going in for a physical. <laughs> this isn't like, I don't know. A fifth thing they said was, it's a good idea to get a relational checkup. <laughs> That's even more stressful. Uh, it, the sixth thing they say, if you're alone and you want to be in a relationship, get out of the house. <laughs> I like that kind of therapy. <laughs> you don't like where you are? Move. <laughs> they said, take some time out and look for the good things in your world. That's awesome. The eighth thing they said was, just cut your losses. <laughs> if something's not working, if it's broke, get rid of it. And the ninth thing they said was, take care of yourself. And the tenth thing they said in how to, how to gain security is they said, well, fight insecurity. <laughs> okay, all right. And, and it, it, just, it just reminded me that we don't really know how to be secure in an insecure world. And we look for a lot of things to help us gain feelings of security, feelings that it's going to be okay. And if I were to ask us, what makes you feel secure? What makes you feel as though it's going to be all right? I wonder how many of us would respond with, well, that's an easy answer. It's the name of God. I don't know how many of us would immediately go to, in an insecure world, the best thing for me to find security is just go to the name of God. I, I don't know that's our go-to. And I started thinking, why is that? And this is what I came up with. I don't think we know God's specific name for our specific need, so we don't know what name to go to. I don't think we understand the power of the name. For us, a person's name is just nomenclature. It's Bob. It's just nomenclature. I don't, underth I don't think we understand the power of the name biblically. And the third thing, I think we've misunderstood the difference between source and resource. See, most of us look to our resources for feelings of safety and security. 
We look to our job. We look to our bank account. We look to our relationships with people. We look to our, you know, how strategic we can plan out our life. And if all of those are in line, we feel secure. Those are resources. Those aren't the source. And, and if we never get to the source, we're always stuck in the land of resource. And it feels as though resources are never enough. So I looked at Scripture, and this is one of the Bible verses that I want to be kind of our, our theme through this whole series. We're going to look at God's name. Did you know that there are over 80 names of God in the Bible? More than just God and Jesus? He's revealed himself in some profound ways. And this is what the Bible says. It's actually Psalms 20, verse 7, not Proverbs. Psalms 20, verse 7 says this. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in what? You notice it doesn't say, but we trust in God. It says, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. See, this, this is... This is a statement here, and it's a profound statement. They say, some people, see if this isn't us, some people trust in, in chariots and horses. In other words, some people trust in their resources. Some people trust in the security that they garner around them. Some people trust in what they can amass. Some people trust in their ability to protect themselves. Isn't that where we are? When we've got the right insurances, when we've got the right bank account, when we've got the right job, when we've got the right people, when we've got the right scenarios, when we've got the right situation, when we've got the right setting, when we've got the right report, when we've got the right process, there's security in that. And the Bible says some people trust in that, but we trust in what? The name of the Lord our God. There's a command in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 17, verse 16, where God Almighty charges the kings of his people, and he says, don't amass horses to yourself. What's wrong with the king amassing horses? Here's what's wrong. Because in that scenario, when the king would amass horses, horses were the, 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 the war instruments. And God didn't want his leaders, his kings, amassing war instruments to gain their trust in their resources. He wanted them to trust in his name. And this was actually fleshed out in 2 Chronicles 32. I was just reading it this morning. 2 Chronicles 32 was about King Hezekiah. Hezekiah and he gets word that this guy's going to invade the land, invade Jerusalem. And so as a king, he takes his responsibility. He meets with his war generals and his advisors and counselors. He says, how do we protect ourselves against this invading army? And they do what they need to do. They repair the wall of protection around them. They put towers in for uh, military maneuvers. They secure their water sources. They get their supplies all in hand and everything. And then Hezekiah addresses the people. And we've done all we can do within our power. But he says this. He says, don't be afraid of that vast army that's against us. Now, if I'm a general leading my troops into battle, I'm not going to tell them how overpowering the enemy is. But he does. He's like, hey, they are vast. They're powerful. They got a lot more resources than we, we do. Get ready to fight. The men would be like, what the heck? Huh? But he says, he said, let's just acknowledge the truth. There's an enemy coming against us that's bigger than us, that's more, has, is more powerful than us, that we cannot contend with. But this, and then the king says this. But all he has in his favor is an arm of flesh. In other words, he's got the resources. He says, but with us is the Lord our God, and he will fight our battle. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. What do you trust in? So this is why this is so important for us to go through this series because if you are a follower of Jesus, you need to understand the names of God because it is in the names of God that you need to put your trust. All through the Bible, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are saved. It doesn't say, it doesn't say the righteous run to the Lord and are saved. It says, it says it's highlighting the name of the Lord. The, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to his name because they know him. Psalm 34. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt what? His name. Together. Psalm 5. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love what? 
your name be joyful in you. Psalm 148, let them praise what? The name of the Lord, for his what is exalted? His name is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Isaiah 52, 6 says literally, those who know his name know his voice. Because he's spoken to us in the revelation of his name. And if you don't know his name, you don't know his voice. Because his name is speaking to us what he does and what we can expect of him. And if all we know of God is God and Jesus, we're missing who he is. And we can't hear him speak to us. If you have a name, a need, he has a name that addresses it. And all throughout scripture, God reveals himself through his names. And when we study his names as revealed in the Bible, we understand better who he is. Because his name reveals the central person of God and his very nature and what you can expect of him. Now, there's a real famous Bible verse that most people have heard. It's part of the Big Ten. When God was setting his people apart, so I'm going to give you ten big ones you've got to pay attention to, the Ten Commandments. And it's part of those ten. And most of you have heard this, this part of it. He's, God says in Exodus 20, You shall not take the, na- the, what? Name. the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his what? His name in vain. And most people are like, well, we're good there because I don't say that real bad cuss word. That's not necessarily what this is about. He says, don't take my name in vain. When he says that word name there, he means literally his reputation, my activity. Don't consider my reputation. Don't consider my activity. Don't consider my name in a vain way. It means as empty as void of conduct, as of no impact. Here's the thing. He says, you need to understand that my name is my reputation and my na- the name itself, just not me behind the name, the name itself has conduct and has ability. And if you think that speaking my name does not bear consequence in your reality, you hold it as vanity. And the Bible says, I will not hold you guiltless if you consider my name, the very name, not just me, but my name as having no impact. You understand? So we need to understand his name and the power that his name holds and the power that resides in his name and acknowledge it and not think that the name itself is of little consequence. It's of grave consequence. Because you know why? Because his name matters. His name matters. The disciples saw Jesus do all kinds of stuff. Saw him walk on water, saw him heal people, raise dead people, get a a coin out of a fish's mouth. I mean, just crazy stuff. You know, feed multitudes of people with nothing. Just incredible stuff. And so his his disciples was watching Jesus, asked Jesus to teach them one thing. The only thing recorded in Scripture that asked Jesus to teach him, do you know what it was? It wasn't to walk on water and walk through walls. Do you know what it was? It's how to pray. They said, Jesus, we, we, we understand that, that what you do is in direct relation to how you pray. And we want to do what you do, but we got to know how to pray like you pray. And so Jesus said, fine, I'll teach you how to pray. And so he taught them the prayer that most people have heard at some point. And he began with our Father in heaven. It's our Father. This is a community thing. Our Father in heaven, what did he say next? Hallowed be your name. His name must matter. If Jesus is teaching people how to pray, and that's where he starts, you start with the most important thing. Hallowed be your name. Why? Because his name is holy. It means set apart. Holy means set apart. So I have to keep his name set apart. His name matters. And if I'm going to keep his name set apart, I have to address this issue of sin. Because here's the thing, here's what we have to understand. Without the admittance and the confrontation of sin, of the depth of our sin, there's no magnificence of grace. To hallow God's name means that I honor that which is holy of God. And when I honor that which is holy of God, it automatically illuminates that which is unholy in me. Do you understand that? 
I don't feel like you're getting this. <laughs> to hollow God's name means to honor that which is holy about him. And anytime I honor that which is holy about him, it illuminates which is unholy in me. See, and this is what the Old Testament law was designed to do. The Old Testament law was designed to magnify God's holiness and illuminate the fact that we were unable to emulate it. And only in the face of God's unadulterated holiness can we experience the unfathomable grace of God Almighty. See, grace only exists when sin is exposed. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, where, great, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so the Old Testament law, all the Old Testament law did was tell the truth. That we can't keep it and thereby are declared sinners. And the Old Testament sacrificial system simply foreshadowed grace that was embodied by Jesus on the cross. But it starts with the hallowing of God's name. He is holy. And admitting that we are so unholy, even our name is vile when compared to his. So that we can throw ourselves at his mercy and experience the enormity of his grace. See, when we downplay the role of sin, when we downplay sin, we remove the person from the experience and the benefit of grace. And one of the first things we have to do in considering the names of God, because Jesus said, hallow is his name, is to address the issue of sin. And what that means for you and me is that we agree that there are things in our lives that the Bible says is sinful. We agree with that. Because only in the admittance of sin is the experience of grace. And what's happened in today's world, today's church, is in an effort to be full of mercy and full of grace and full of love, teachers and theologians in this day have downplayed sin. And so they said, well, God's love covers everything, so it's all good. And, you know, I'm not sure anymore what sin is. It's up to the individual and God. And I can't pronounce this as sinful and that as sinful because, you know, it's, it's it, no. I mean, in an effort, we need to be loving and merciful and gracious. Absolutely. But that doesn't, pre, it doesn't prevent, like, this is sin. Because only when we acknowledge that can we experience grace. So in an effort to be loving and merciful and graceful and downplaying sin, we remove the person from grace, from the very thing we're hoping to connect them to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like you can think of all the things you want to think of. You want to think of adultery, is that sin? It's only by admitting that it is that you have the opportunity for grace. Is stealing and robbing sin? It's only by agreeing with what the Bible says that it's sinful. Is there grace for the thief? Can I press a little bit? Is not tithing sin? The Bible says when you don't tithe, you rob God. You're embezzling his funds. Do you agree with that? <laughs> so then admit the depth of your sin that you're a thief and you're robbing from God because only in that is the opportunity for grace. Do you understand? Don't try to explain it away. What well, was an Old Testament thing? Baloney. Jesus affirmed it in Matthew 23, 23. That's Old Testament law. Baloney. The Old Testament law also says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are you going to cast that out too? And don't explain it away. Just admit you're, you're wrong. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, does it make sense? Is gossiping a sin? Careful what you post on social media. Admit you're a sinner. Because only in that is her grace. Do you understand? How about a homosexual lifestyle? Is living that lifestyle sinful? Yeah, it is. The Bible says so. And only in the immense of it is there grace for someone who's struggling with that. What they ultimately need is mercy and grace, right? So, but the acknowledgement of you're holy, God, I'm not. Your word is right, I'm not. I'm going to admit that, then I got mercy and grace. Right? Sex outside of marriage, is it sinful? Okay, admit it, right? Because only in that is, you understand what I'm saying? And so Jesus says, look, let's start at the beginning. Hallow my name. Acknowledge what is holy about me and unholy about you. 
Because only then do you put yourself in a position to experience mercy and grace. See, admitting the greatness of our sin is the only pathway to his amazing grace. And Jesus says, it starts with you hallowing my name. Because my name, don't carry my name in a way that conveys it is of no effect. See, the name of God indicates relationship, the person, the character, the power, the authority, the activity of him. If you only know God as God, basically you know him as the big guy upstairs. And he is. See, here's the thing. When we know God as God and Jesus as Jesus, and that's about what we know of his name, it keeps us in a religious position with the Almighty. And the devil doesn't mind people having religion. He doesn't mind people being religious. He just doesn't want people to have a relationship with God. Here's how I know. In the creation account, every time in the book of Genesis, every time in the creation account where the Bible records God interacting with humans, every time it includes him, God interacting with humans, it uses the phrase, the Lord God. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord God. Every time God acts with humans, it talks about the Lord God. Because the Lord part, and we'll talk about this in a minute, has to do with the personal God who's inter intersects with human activity and God the great creator so the great creator God is also Lord the one who intervenes in human history and every time in the creation account where the, where the Bible records the Lord God interacting with humans it's saying the almighty God creator is involved in your personal life until we get to Genesis 3 in Genesis 3 it changes because in Genesis 3 the devil comes and talks to Eve and this is where the where it changes the conversation changes now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animal other wild animals the Lord God the personal God creator had made. He said to the woman, "Did God really say what happened?" He dropped the Lord. He took the personal creator God and took away the personal part of it and said, "Did your religious leader say?" Did you ever notice that about the Bible? Did God really say you must not eat of any of the tree of the garden? The devil said, look, you can keep your religion with the big guy upstairs. He just wants to rob us of the relational part with the creator. And the Lord God became God and Eve walked away from the Lord. And so this is what happens. Many people have grown up in church with religion and the devil hasn't minded. Because the devil knows that we cannot be fulfilled by religion. And that's why so many people leave the church as young adults. Having no relationship, they leave religion. Do you understand? That's been some of your story. You've known God. But you haven't known who he is personally as he's revealed himself. And he's given us his personal names to indicate both the relationship he wants to have with us and tell us the benefits of of that relationship. Here's what I know. If we don't know God's names, we don't fully understand his person, nor can we call on his word, which is based on his person. God's names matter. Throughout the Old Testament, he has continually conveyed his person to individuals who have hallowed his name. Don't miss that. Throughout Scripture, God has continually conveyed his person to the individuals who have hallowed his name. Not to those who haven't. See, Jesus is everything that God is. And the characters of, characteristics of who Jesus is are seen in the Old Testament because Jesus is God. And if we read the Old Testament without knowing the person of God behind the names, we end up with religious rules and condemnation. And that's why the God of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New Testament seem like they're two different entities when they're not. We just haven't understood his names. Now, this series is going to be deeply theological and incredibly practical. All these names we're going to look at are Old Testament names of God. And we're going to discover what Jesus means when Jesus said all the scriptures in the Old Testament point forward to me. They're revealed in me. And so we're going to do the hard work of learning together to interpret the Old Testament in light of the new covenant of Jesus. Because Jesus is irresistible. And he is magnificent. 
and I want to show them to you in full color. We experience Jesus' full glory when we see him as revealed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament names of God reveal the New Testament person of Jesus. This is what the Bible says in Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God. All these invisible characteristics that we're going to see in God's names are revealed in the person of Jesus. It's a beautiful marriage of this invisible creator fleshed out in the real world. And God gives us his names. There's over 80 names and combinations of names of God. He gives us all these names because one name isn't sufficient to encompass all that God is. And if we know God only as God, we miss who he is. And God's names indicate to us that God and God alone is our source. God self-identifies himself as the I am. Jehovah, I am the source is what God says. And every time God gives us a name, he's saying, I am the source of your need. Your need is this, my name addresses that need, and I am the source of that. Whatever, see, God has made himself the source, and he's the only source. And anything we have outside of God is not the source, it's a resource. And when we can, can confuse the, the source with the resource, we end up serving the resource and neglect the source, and God doesn't ever honor it. God's names remind us that he is the source and he alone is our source. And knowing his names keeps us humble because we know that I, when I proclaim his name, I'm proclaiming, proclaiming him as my source and I have no resource apart from him. And any time we treat a resource as the source, that's idolatry and God will never bless it. Here's what I mean. It real practically, Okay. If I view my bank account and my finances as the source of my provision, that's my idol. Do you understand? I can pray all I want that God blesses my finances, but God is not going to bless something I'm going to credit to an idol. And when I understand God's name is Jehovah, the personal God, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, I understand my source is God and his provision, I can get real generous with my finances because I know that my generosity is not based on my resource of my bank account or my job or my investments. I know that my provision is based on Jehovah Jireh, who is my provider. I can give all his stuff away. He can keep giving it. Do you understand? Do you understand? It's the same with every need you have in life. But here's what I know. If, you don't, if we don't know God's names, we won't trust his source. And until we establish this principle in life, we will always be controlled by the presence or absence of our resources. His names will tell you the source. So, so I'm going to get to it now. That was all just that was introduction. <laughs> I'm going to give you three foundational names of God. And all the other names, most of the other names that are revealed to us in Scripture are come out of these three foundational names. And, so, and so, so here's these three foundational names. Elohim, Jehovah, and Adonai. Elohim, Jehovah, and Adonai. Now just for your knowledge, Jehovah there you see in parentheses YHWH. It's known as the Tetragrammaton. It's four consonants. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. When God says, I'm going, to show, I'm going to tell you my personal name, he said this. We've added letters to it, translated it to be Jehovah. Okay, that's his personal name. That's when I show up in your history, I'm going to come as that. Elohim, Jehovah, and Adonai. This is what they mean. Elohim. Genesis 1.1, where we first see it. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. This is the big guy. This is the Almighty. This is, the, this is the creator of heaven and earth. This is the one who is self-existent, the all-powerful, the creator, the one who is outside of space and time, who is outside the space and time continuum. There was a time when time didn't exist, and God is so big, he created time. And God is so big, he is already past, he is already present, he is already future. Everything is consistent in the present with God because he is bigger than time. This is Elohim, do you understand? This is the Almighty. This is God. 
This is the one who is not bound by the laws that he established the universe to function on. He's above all of that. El is the word God, and it's added to that, Elohim. The fact that it ends in I am in the Hebrew means it's a plural word. So God from the beginning existed in plurality, the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit. That's Elohim. And it's used in other connections of other words, El Elyon, El Shaddai, to encompass his character. Matter of fact, in Psalm 91, he uses both of those together. Those who dwell in the secret place of worship of El Elyon, the Almighty King, will live under the shadow of El Shaddai, the sustainer, the nurturer, the one who overturns human history for his glory and your benefit. You live in the worship of El Elyon, the Almighty. You will dwell in the shadow of El Shaddai, who turns history into your favor. Elohim, do you understand? This is the Almighty. And all of this is reflected in Jesus in the New Testament. Colossians 1, for in him, Jesus, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. Everything we see of God in the Old Testament, we see of Jesus in the New Testament. He's the fleshed out living version of what we see in the invisible God in the Old Testament. Elohim, the Almighty, it is Jesus. Do you understand? When we pray and when we say the word God, this is the one we're talking about. God, I need you to show up. I need you to overturn. I need you to be present. You are the Almighty. That's one of the foundational names of God. But another foundational name of God is Jehovah. Yahweh, Jehovah. This is so interesting to me. Exodus 3, 14. God said to Moses, God, anytime you see the Old Testament, the word God there, it's Elohim. So the big creator, God Almighty, said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you say to the Israelite. I am has sent me to you. When it says the word I am there, it means Jehovah. The big creator Elohim says, I am your personal God. I involve myself in your personal history. When Jehovah is oftentimes is coupled with other aspects to see the grandness and the power and magnificence of the personal God who involves himself in your personal life and your personal need. Here's the deal. For every need you have, God has a specific name that addresses it. The thing that's amazing to me at the burning bush, when Moses was standing before the burning bush and God spoke to the bush, the Bible says literally, Jehovah saw Moses and Elohim said to him. The Bible doesn't say things on accident. It says Jehovah saw Moses and Elohim spoke to him. Here's what it's telling us, that there is a personal God who sees your very need, who knows where you are, who sees where you stand, who understands what's coming in the future. He's a personal God and he can get the almighty God whom he also is to act as the creator and bring the almighty power to bear in your situation. Jehovah saw and Elohim spoke. In the Bible, whenever you see the words in the Old Testament, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's the indication that Jehovah is the one they're talking about. Capital L, small o, r, d is Lord. It means something different. So the foundational names of God are Elohim, the great creator, And Jehovah, the personal God, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the Jehovah God, Jehovah Jireh, your provider, Jehovah Rophi, your healer, Jehovah Rohi, your shepherd, Jehovah Shalom, your peace. And it's interesting, Exodus 3, Exodus 6, 1 through 3. Then the Lord, capital all caps, Jehovah, said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Because I am the personal God, Jehovah, who is involved in human history, I will move Pharaoh's hand and make him let you go. God, Elohim... The Almighty Creator once said to Moses, uh, said to Moses I am the Lord. Elohim said to Moses, I am the personal God. I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty, as Elohim. I showed them who I was as the creator, but by my name, Jehovah, I didn't make myself known to them. I'm making myself known to you that way because I will gradually show myself in extraordinarily encompassing ways that reveal more of who I am. To some, I showed myself as the creator, but they didn't know me as Jehovah. I'm showing myself as Jehovah to you because I want to be involved in your personal life. Do you understand? There's a personal God who wants to intervene in your specific need with the power of the Almighty. 
He is Jehovah God. And God gives us these names of himself to meet your specific needs so that you will, con- you will call on him by his name and use it when you need him to intersect in your life in that specific way for your specific need. There, there, there are some people who know me, who know me really, really well. And they know my name. They know what I like to be called. They know how to get my attention when they talk to me. And I will move heaven and earth for them. There are other people who know me as Mr. Roth, as pastor, as reverend. And by how they address me, I know that they don't know me. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm saying? And we don't have much of a relationship. Because if you really knew me, you wouldn't address me like that. And I might respond to you if you address me like that out of my own mercy and grace, which isn't much. <laughs> but to those who know me, who know how to address me, I'll bring all my resource I have and my ability to bear upon them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know why knowing God's names is so important? Jehovah God was revealed in Jesus. The religious leaders were talking to Jesus. They said, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did all the prophets. Who do you think you are, Jesus? And Jesus answered them. I'll tell you who I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Guess what he said there? I'm Jehovah. I am God. If he said before Abraham was born, I was, that means something totally different. He's using the personal name of God. You need to understand who I am. Everything that's invisible about God is visible in Christ. The foundational names of God, Elohim, Jehovah, and Adonai. Adonai means master and sovereign, and it is translated, in the Bible is translated capital L, small o-r-d. Anywhere in the Old Testament you see the Lord, capital L, small O-R-D, God. It's Adonai Elohim. Anytime you see capital O-L, capital O, capital R, capital E, that's Jehovah. They're different. Jehovah is the personal God that's involved in your personal story. Adonai is master. The one to whom we must submit. The one to whom is the leader. The one to whom is the master. Psalm 97, 5. Psalm 97.5 says, The mountains melt like wax before whom? Before Jehovah, the personal God. Before the master of the entire earth. Paul and James both refer to Jesus as their master. Paul, a servant of Christ, because he is my master. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, my master. Jesus is as God is the master. Here's the point, and we got to get this. One of the greatest ways to get to know God is to need God. We don't just know God through contemplation and through prayer. We know God by having a need that forces us to contemplate his name. So here's my question. Which of his names addresses your personal need? Do you know him that well? See, the names of God give us the legal right to transact spiritual business with him. And by his name... We gain legal access to God when his name comes through an authorized user. One who is submitted to Adonai, the master. You understand? Let me see how many different ways I can say this. I'm going to say the same thing over and over and over. Because this, we've got to get this at the front end of this series. The way we get the power of Elohim to show up in our situation is to draw near to Jehovah as we submit to Adonai. Do you understand? we got to get this. We all want God Almighty to show up and to reveal himself in the midst of our need. 
The only way that happens is by submission to Adonai. When we submit to the master who is Adonai, God our Adonai, the relational God Jehovah will display the great power of Elohim. But one doesn't come in the absence of the other. And if you have a need and you want God Almighty to show up with his authoritative power of the Almighty Creator Elohim in your personal need and you need Jehovah to appear and reveal himself, you have to place yourself positionally under the rulership of Adonai, the Master. And if you want the power of Almighty Elohim, you have to first submit to the master, your Adonai, before Jehovah will reveal himself in your need. Do you understand? See, here's my fear. My great, come on up, Rick. My fear is this, that so many of us, and rightfully so, we want the power of God to reveal himself in our lives, in our personal situation, in our need, but we haven't submitted to Adonai. And when we're living outside the rulership of Adonai, the great Elohim will never show up in a personal way as Jehovah. Like we don't get God Almighty to show up where we live and breathe if we're not also simultaneously submitting to the Master. And so to live outside of His will in our finances, not submitting our finances to His will, you can't get God Almighty to show up as Jehovah Jireh, your provider, because you haven't submitted. When you're living in sin with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you can't get God Almighty to reveal your spouse and to bless your relationship because you've not submitted. And so the God, your shepherd, doesn't shepherd you in that relationship. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm trying. So many of us want God, God, I'm here, I'm at church, I'm reading the Bible, I'm trying, but the submission hadn't come, and God Almighty isn't going to show up as your Jehovah nothing, though he desperately wants to. Philippians 2, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. Whatever thing you can name, God has a name that's bigger than it. But he doesn't reveal that until there's been submission to the name of the Adonai, your God. Jehovah Jireh is the name that is bigger than any lack you can name. And he will show himself as your provider. If you submit to the Adonai, then the Almighty God releases his resources through Jehovah Jireh in your life. Do you understand that? Jehovah Rophi is the name of God our healer. Jehovah Rophi is the name of God our shepherd. And he will shepherd you through any confusion. If you submit to Adonai, the almighty God releases his clarity as your shepherd, your direction. Your Some of your minds are so confused and they're so in disarray and you can't even feel like emotion. You get your feet underneath you and God wants to be your Jehovah Shalom, your peace that passes understanding. But that will never come until you submit to Adonai and then the Almighty God releases his almighty peace that rules the universe through Jehovah Shalom in your life. But the submission to Adonai has to be there. His names matter. Whatever name you can name, God has a name that's bigger than that. And he wants to release that in your life. But you've got to submit to Adonai. Others trust in chariots and others trust in horses and their bank accounts and their philosophies and their systems and their insurance and their job and all that. But we trust in the name of Elohim, who is our Jehovah, and we submit to our Adonai. So here's the deal. This week when a need arises in your life, submit to the master and bring yourself in right condition with him and speak the name of God that addresses your need and call on his name in declaration and prayer and trust that the name that you name is greater than the need that you can name. All the while submitting to God's prerogative to do what God wants to do and allow what God wants to do, you're submitted to the master do you understand? His names matter. 
Let's pray.